Good morning to our guest of honor, Professor Mark, and good afternoon all. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to today's lecture held by medical faculty of Diponegoro University with Prof. Mark Felsticke as the speaker. My name is Novi Angriani. I am a staff from cardiology and vascular medicine department of Diponegoro University. I will be your MC and also moderator for today's event. Ladies and gentlemen, our main agenda is the lecture from our distinguished guest, Professor Mark, entitled Comprehensive Update in Diagnosis and Treatment of Chronic Venous Insufficiency. Following that, we will have a question and answer session. First, I'd like to read a brief introduction of our guest speaker. Thank you, Professor Mark, for accepting our invitation despite of your busy schedule. Professor Mark is the head of surgical department in St. Andrew's Hospital in Tilt, Belgium. He pioneered the intravenous laser ablation. He was the first one who pioneered it in Belgium. He also co-developed the innovative tulip fiber treatment for varicose veins. He, he graduated his doctor in biomedical science of Catholic University in Leuven and his surgery training was in Netherlands and University of Hospital Leuven, Belgium, and also from academic hospitals in Radboud, uh, Nijmegen, Netherlands. And then now we have come to our main agenda. Professor Mark, the time is yours. You may start your lecture. Thank you, Novi, for the introduction. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I hope so. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'll talk to you about a comprehensive update in diagnosis and treatment of chronic venous insufficiency. Um, the picture on the right side is uh, the hospital where I'm working. The left side is probably the, the place where you are sitting now, I suppose. Uh, but now at this moment, I'm in Paris um, attending a meeting, a vascular meeting. So greetings from Paris. The many closures. So before uh, bef uh, before uh, talking about the pathology of the venous system, I first like to uh, say something about the normal functioning of this uh, system, um, the anatomy and the physiology. But probably you're uh, quite uh, familiar with that, but maybe a small recapitulation. Um, in the venous system, we distinguish the deep venous and the superficial uh, system, um, which are connected by perforating veins. The veins are uh, completely different uh, compared to arteries because they are bigger. They have a a big diameter, the vein wall is smaller, they have valves, and there's a low pressure, low flow system. Yeah. That, but the flow has to go um, in, in direction um, against gravity, and for this reason, we have uh, valves. So this uh, blood flow um, is supported by an, um, a pressure gradient. So as you can see, the, the arteries, the pressure is about 120 mercury, millimeter mercury. It drops to 60, uh, 20 in the capillaries, and veins have only a pressure of about 12 uh, millimeter mercury. Um, this uh, allows the blood flow um, against gravity, but there's some other uh, things helping, uh, which also the, 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 the pressure inside the thoracic cavity. So when you're breathing, um, your thorax is opening, and then you create a negative pressure which sucks the blood from uh, the from the legs in, inside the thorax. Also, the right heart pumping uh, helps this process. But what's very important in the venous circulation is the muscle pump. And every time you're walking, there's a contraction of the muscles in the calf, and they uh, push the blood uh, upside. Um, and when these muscles are uh, relaxing, then uh, the blood from the superficial system is sucked into the deep venous system. And this allows the blood to have an irrational flow from distally to proximal. Uh, we have three um, important um, muscle pumps. One is in the, at the foot, second one is at the calf, and the third one is the thigh. But the calf pump is the most important one. And the pathology starts when this venous return is impaired. So when you have a venous hypertension. And this can be caused by several things. You also have to look first, is it the deep venous system or the superficial venous system? Do we talk about insufficiency or obstruction? 
it surely can have a combination, combination of, of several of them. But also very importantly is the muscle pump, as already explained. If the muscle pump is not working well, then of course you will create a venous hypertension. And this venous hypertension creates some, some pathology, pathology attack. Um, first of all, you have a triggering of the uh, of reaction in the vein wall, activation of leukocytes, and they are migrating, then resulting in infection of the endothelium, um, increased capillary permeability, and of course, then degradation of extracellular matrix, which leads to weakening of the vein wall, destruction of the valve leaflets, and again, more venous hypertension. So this is a self-enforcing process, um, which results in um, skin changes and um, even observation at long time. So he can see a picture of an incompetent um, short, small cell venous vein, uh, which results, of course, in varicose veins, and it can lead to some complications like a thrombosis and even, in rare cases, uh, pulmonary embolism. So the, com the complications can be, uh, can be dangerous. So the results are part of course microvascular reactions. You have a lot of inflammatory reactions in the vein wall, which are responsible for endothelium destruction and lymphatic destruction as well, which ends in skin damage, edema, and ulceration. So this is the end stage of uh, the venous disease, it is an active venous also. The venous uh, pathology is classified according to the SEP classification, and we uh, come from C0 to C6. C0 is a normal vein. C1 is uh, the presence of telling artesia. C2, presence of uh, varicose veins. C3 is varicose veins in combination with edema. C4 is uh, skin changes like um, uh, eczema or hyperpigmentation. C4B is more advanced skin changes like um, hypodermatosclerosis and atrophy blanche, and C5 is in healed also, C6 is an active venous also, which is end stage of the disease. And it's quite uh, <coughs> very common in this um, pathology. So we did an epidemiological study in Belgium, um, which has been published in 2015. Um, this um, data come from uh, GPs, the general practitioners who are seeing uh, patients, patient came to the GPs for anything, it could be for a vaccination or for hypertension or anything, but 20 consecutive patients had to be screened for the presence of venous disease. Then these patients were uh, is classified according to the CF classification. And you can see a very high presence of um, venous disease, about 16% do have varicose veins, and nearly 1% does have an active venous ulcer. So <clears throat> you can see the classification. Um, C3 to C6 is what we call chronic venous insufficiency. C1 to C6 is chronic venous disease. We see on this near about 25% of um, all adult patients does have chronic venous insufficiency in Belgium, which is a great number. I refer to another epidemiologic study done in Germany by Eberhard Rabe. And he could see that about 23% of the adult uh, population did have varicose veins. About 11 to 70% did have chronic venous insufficiency, which is the more advanced stage of the disease. Of the disease. But this uh, venous disease is a progressive disease, which means that uh, when it left an untreated, uh, patient will have more and more signs and symptoms of the disease. There's some risk factors interfering with uh, this disease. So we can see that in some families, there are much more uh, people having this chronic venous disease compared to other families. So this must be some genetic component in the disease. Other risk factors are pregnancy, obesity, prolonged standing, smoking, especially in men, and the lack of regular exercise, being female, age getting older. But you could see also some differences uh, in um, region uh, and even race. There's, so um, this study also had been performed in many other countries, so we could uh, compare the results. And you can see in Western Europe, uh, we have a chronic venous insufficiency in 36% compared in Asia, 19%. This is a big difference. So why do we have that, those differences? Um, the, the, the population is different also in Europe compared to Asia. 
Um, in Europe, we have a lot of um, bigger people, um, taller people, and high body mass index. But what's most important is age. We have an old population. So average pay, people are much older in Western Europe compared to Asia, and this could uh, explain the mono, this could explain the differences we see in the prevalence of the venous disease. We do some statistical analysis, um, some um, logistical regression uh, to correct the data uh, for, with these risk factors, and after this, the differences in the prevalence between uh, Asia and Western Europe uh, diminished. But the natural history of the disease is progression. And the velocity of this progression is very variable, but uh, some studies show that you have a progression rate to higher clinical station stages in about 4% a year. This means progression from C2 to C3 or from C3 to C4, about 4% each year. Half of the patients with unilateral varicosis will develop uh, varicose veins at the control site in five years. And one third of patients with varicose veins will develop skin changes over a period of 10 years. And untreated people will develop more signs and symptoms, which has a major impact on patient's quality of life. So what are the, 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 the symptoms of the disease? First of all, patients complain about heaviness, about tightness of the leg. They complain about pain, sensation of burning, night cramps, itching, having restless legs, and having sensation of pins and needles. Clinically, uh, you can see the, the signs of it, varicose veins, edema, skin changes, ulcers healed or active. Again, this is a CF classification which can be used for diagnosis of the disease. But very importantly is um, duplex ultrasound. Um, so every patient you would like to treat, uh, you, should have, you should do a duplex ultrasound because this is very important. What's the underlying cause of the disease? Is it a superficial disease? Is it deep venous disease or a combination of both? We will talk about insufficiency of or obstruction. This examination has to be done in supine and standing position, both. Other uh, additional investigation are sometimes venogram, but you don't do that anymore. Venogram, uh, we only do this in a, in a setting, a preoperative setting for people with deep venous insufficiency or uh, venous, deep venous obstruction but not as a, as a routine um, examination. CT scan, we do this when we um, suspect some intra-abdominal uh, pathology, a compression like uh, maybe an intra-abdominal tumor, adenopathy, um, pelvic, in, um, pelvic venous problems. MR angio is only done um, in the setting of a post-traumatic syndrome, like iliac vein compression, maternal syndrome, IVUS, intervascular ultrasound, we use this during the procedure, during venous stenting. So the treatment, how can you treat this patient? First, you have to start with conservative treatment. You can advise some lifestyle adaptation, so you can uh, ask the patient to have more uh, regular exercise, start walking, lose some weight, stop smoking. Um, some um, some of, the, of these risk factors can be influenced. Unfortunately, not all. Getting older is part of life. Being female is difficult to change. Getting pregnant is part of life. So some, some risk factors can be influenced, but many are, are not influenceable. Next step is compression. Um, we have a huge um, variety of uh, stockings uh, varying from class one to class four. Can also use bandages, elastic or non-elastic bandages. So what's how does compression work? With compression, you compress the veins. But you have the same amount of blood passing through the leg. So when you have the same amount of fluid, it has to go to a smaller vessel. The result will be increased blood flow. So when you have increased blood flow, um, then um, the circulation is better and you have less venous uh, stasis and less venous hypertension. You have also a um, reduction of interstitial fluid and a reduction of stasis and venous congestion when you use compression. Compression has also a positive influence on the muscle pump. So there are different classes of stockings you can use, class one, uh, class two, class three. Um, for patients with venous disease, you mostly use class two stockings. Class three is for um, advanced disease of patients with ulcer. 
So we can, this uh, picks on the right side is an also kit. You, you, you first uh, put the white sock and then the, the, the brown one. So this is a class one sock uh, with a class two makes together class three. Class four is, 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 is we don't use that because it's uh, too hot, it's too difficult to, to fit on the patient. Then you have elastic bandages. Um, for patients with um, acute swelling with uh, edema, we advise to use non-elastic uh, compression. Um, you can have a high pressure up to uh, 40 to 60 millimeter mercury. Unfortunately, this, um, this uh, compression is difficult to, to, to handle and um, sometimes it, it doesn't fit anymore and um, the, the, the bandages get loose. So um, therefore, after the acute setting, we switch to uh, elastic bandages, which are more easy to, foot, to put on. Uh, the pressure is lower, but uh, as for chronic uh, treatment, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's enough uh, pressure between the 20 and 40 millimeters mercury. So for an ac acute setting, non-elastic, a chronic setting, elastic bandages. So what 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 the um, what what this literature show? Um, using compression, um, you have a significant reduction of edema, and improves the symptoms uh, of the patient with venous disease. It has also a positive effect on patient quality of life. But up to now, this insufficient information, insufficient data to support that compression should have any influence on the progression of the disease. There's only one study with a limited amount of uh, patients included to show that there's a higher incidence of progression of the disease with patients who are non-compliant to the stockings. But um, when you're young and you have to uh, work a lot and say, I have, I have put some stockings to avoid having been diseased, I think um, um, there's no data supporting this, uh, this theory. Next step is drugs, medication. Flibotonics, we call them. You have uh, different kinds of flibotonics. You have uh, synthetic products, uh, flavonoids, saponins, and plant extracts. How does this, this uh, flibotonics work? They have an influence on the inflammatory reaction in the vein wall. Um, I showed you the picture with this um, uh, self enforcing um, process of this inflammatory reaction. Well, this is where um, this medication uh, has some influence. It reduces the expression of these molecules. It reduces the uh, migration of leukocytes, and it decreases capillary permeability. So it improves venous tone. But fortunately, there are no data that uh, these medications had any influence on the progression of the disease. So these medications, as the compression, they have an influence on the symptomatology, such as pain, heaviness, feeling of swelling, cramps, prosthesia, and edema, but they have no influence on the progression of the disease, unfortunately. But we need more studies uh, to see the uh, results of the medication. Some, uh, some medications do have some um, scientific support, others do not have them. So the guidelines say inactive drugs should be considered as a treatment option for swelling and pain caused by chronic venous disease. Also in the treatment of a venous ulcer, this in addition to compression. But after this uh, conservative treatment, you have still other options, interventional treatments, such as sclerotherapy, surgery, endovenous techniques, um, um, other interventional techniques. And the purpose of this is to correct the venous hypertension. When you correct this venous hypertension, you have a significant positive influence on the patient's quality of life. But then again, before starting any uh, interventional treatment, you should uh, take into consideration what's the underlying cause of the disease. Again, do we talk about superficial disease or uh, deep, venous, deep venous disease? Do we talk about obstruction or insufficiency? Again, duplex mapping is very important. You have to do this in standing position and in, in spine position. Look at the patient, see what's, what's wrong. Uh, here you can see a patient with a uh, superficial insufficiency uh, with greater venous pain uh, who is incompetent. Make nice drawing of it um, on the patient, on the map, so we can clearly see what's going wrong. And so we can treat the patient like we did in this patient uh, in the venous laser ablation. Another tool is scler sclerotherapy. 
Um, liquid sclerotherapy therapy you can use for cosmetics uh, reasons, for instance, for to treat uh, tilling artesia. Um, one side effect of this treatment is you can have some hyperpigmentation, especially in people with some um, um, darker skins, people with um, uh, more pigment, uh, pigmented skin, they risk having uh, more um, hyperpigmentation due to the sclerosis. Um, when you like to treat bigger veins with sclerotherapy, we use foam sclerosis. This is a very nice tool in treatment of uh, venous recurrence. But again, the complications are hyperpigmentation, recanalization, and even uh, superficial venous uh, thrombosis. Surgery. Surgery was a gold standard treatment uh, for uh, superficial venous disease, let's say 20 to 30 years ago. Then they, make, they made, made an incision at the groin and uh, also somewhere at the, in the leg, and we removed the incompetent uh, veins. This is a very radical uh, treatment, which resulted in um, some postpartive co um, complications like uh, uh, hematomas, uh, pain, paresthesia, even wound infections. But in the long term, the, uh, the patient satisfaction was good. So let's say about 20 years ago, um, we started with uh, endovenous techniques, uh, which were minimal invasive, um, like endovenous laser ablation with the frequency and so on. We distinguish thermal versus non-thermal ablation. Thermal ablation includes laser, radio frequency, and steam. Non-thermal ablation is um, mocha and um, glue ablation. These uh, treatments are used for ablation of the truncal veins, which means the great saphenous vein, small saphenous vein, and the saphenous vein. The varicose veins are treated itself with a concomitant filibectomies. So here I have some pictures of these endovenous techniques, thermal ablation, non-thermal ablation. We do it uh, on, the, on the local tumor center anesthesia um, in out setting, out patient, uh, patient uh, setting. So patients do not have to stay overnight in the hospital. All these techniques have a similar outcome. So there's no proven difference in outcome between laser radio frequency, steam, um, and even the glue. The only difference is um, in glue, they uh, don't have to put stockings after the treatment compared to laser, and you don't have to use um, um, tumescent uh, liquid. But on postoperative pain outcome, there's no significant difference. So the side branches are treated with a phlebectomy uh, using small incisions, uh, also on tumescent anesthesia. Why do you inject tumors and anesthesia? This to in, 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 induce spasm of these veins uh, and avoid some postoperative ecomosis, even hematomas. This is what we call the Muller technique. Um, so these uh, treatments is, uh, are very effic uh, efficient and they result in high uh, patient satisfaction rate, have a positive influence on the patient postoperative quality of life. And the venous techniques have compared to surgery less side effects, faster recovery, or more aesthetic. And this, that's why they are recommended in the guidelines as the first choice in treatment of superficial vein incompetence. So you hear the guidelines uh, for patients with um, superficial, uh, patient with, uh, super, uh, superficial vein incompetence, uh, presenting with varicose veins, interventional treatment is recommended class one, level B. And for patients with superficial venous incompetence presenting changes as a result of chronic venous disease, interventional treatment of venous incompetence is recommended. So this is from the last guidelines, which have been published in February this year. But unfortunately, after all those treatments, uh, we have patients with, um, who are happy, um, good quality of life, uh, high, um, uh, high patient satisfaction rate, but we have unfortunately a very high recurrence rate. About 40, 50% of five years, about 70% of patients at 10 years does have a recurrence. Now, for all interventions we perform nowadays, 20% is done to treat the recurrent disease. So why do we have these recurrences? Of course, sometimes you can have a technical or tactical mistake. Therefore, uh, the preoperative duplex mapping is very important. It is, if you're doing something wrong with the preoperative duplex mapping, of course, the result will not be satisfactory. 
can have a treatment failure, like for instance, localization after laser ablation. You also can have some persistent hypertension, which leads to recurrence. Then I think about um, underlying political congestion syndrome, for instance, or um, compression of iliac veins, or um, a failure of um, the muscle pump, for instance, the patients who are paralyzed. Another thing is neovascularization. Is a neovascularization is in um, is some new small veins who are mostly found at the saphenofemoral junction or the popliteal femoral junction. But also you have the progression of disease. Even after treatment, you can have some newly formed reflux in new segments, atomic extension of the existing incompetence of a combination of both. The progression of the disease accounts for 20 to 50% of all recurrences. Nevascularization. So on the, rest, on the right side, you see some pictures of nevascularization you can find with duplex ultrasound. So as I explained, mostly at the saphenofemoral junction, you see it more after surgery compared to endovenous techniques. Also, you can find it sometimes at the phenopropitular junction. It's a complex network of tortuous vessels reconnecting the cut ends at the great saphenous vein and tributaries. We thought this was part of the wound healing after surgery, but unfortunately, we can also see this sometime after laser ablation or after um, radiofrequency ablation, most frequently, but it does exist. So the real cause of this nevascularization is still unknown. We often see it in connection with some lymph nodes. The treatment for this uh, nevascularization is mostly uh, foam, ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy. So as already explained, a pelvic congestion syndrome can be a cause of recurrence, can be a cause of persistent fetus hypertension. But also those patients can be sometimes uh, symptomatic. They complain about pain in the lower abdomen, uh, which is cyclic, and uh, you can see sometimes these varicose veins at the middle side of the tide. The underlying cause is mostly an incompetent left ovarian vein, sometimes also the right side, sometimes also an incompetent of a hypogastric veins but mostly it's an insufficiency of the left ovarian vein, which creates a mass of varicose veins around the uterus, which make a connection with the groin. The, the treatment of this is embolization. So we can use uh, sandwich techniques, which, which is a combination of um, foam injection and coiling. Obstruction. Um, obstruction can be a cause of persistent venous hypertension. So when you see patients treated with varicose vein with fast recurrence, you have to think maybe there's an underlying obstruction, which can be an intraabdominal um, thrombosis, uh, post-thrombotic syndrome, tumors, uh, adenopathy, but sometimes also a Turner syndrome. What's a Turner syndrome? It's a compression of the uh, left common iliac vein, which is squeezed between the right common iliac artery and spine. You can find it more or less in about 20% of female patients. Most of them are asymptomatic, but some of them are asymptomatic and have some atypical symptoms. It's always left leg, young women, they complain about heaviness, about tightness in the leg, sometimes venous claudication, edema, um, thrombosis, at the end stage, even skin changes and ulcerations. How do we diagnose it? We do an MRI, so a um, magnetic resonance to, um, to see this compression. You can also do a venogram during um, treatment. As you can see on the left side, you see a picture of a venogram with a lot of collateral circulation. Um, this, of course, is a proof that there is a significant stenosis at the common at left uh, uh, common iliac vein. And then use IVIS, as you can see in the picture on the right side, which is a catheterization of the vein. And then you can measure the degree of stenosis. So if uh, you follow the screen, you can see the, uh, the vein, the, this iliac vein. And uh, now you will see the tight stenosis. Okay. Um, what's IVIS? IVIS is a, it's a very small catheter, um, it's about 9 French, which is connected with a um, screen and, uh, and this ultrasound measurement of the vein from inside. So you get 
you have some information about this, the degree of stenosis, you can measure it. You can also find some information about the length of the stenosis, and we use it to evaluate our treatment. So um, the left is pre-stenting, and the right side is post-stenting. Use IVIS first to see, is it uh, stenosis significant or not? So significant means stenosis, in a, a stenosis degree of more than 50%. <clears throat> we also see, uh, measure the diameter of the vein proximal and distal to the uh, stenosis to see the, which diameter of stent we have to use. And we also look for a good land, uh, landing zone so we can measure the length of the stent we have to, we have to, to use. Then you have, be, be, beside in May turn, you have the post traumatic syndrome, which also has some similar symptoms like uh, persistent edema pain, venous claudication, skin changes, ulceration, and we see this especially after an iliofemoral thrombosis. Um, after iliofemoral thrombosis, if you have treated your patient with anticoagulation, compression, in mo mostly about 50% of them will develop an occlusion, a permanent occlusion of the iliac veins. The clinical uh, examination is important. You can see some collateral circulation, uh, especially suprapubical, or uh, at the um, abdomen, abdomen wall, you can see, find some collateral circulation. So we see, can see it very often after patients who had an iliofemoral thrombosis. Postsympathetic syndrome can also see after the femoral thrombosis or popliteal thrombosis, but is uh, less less frequently there. So how do this? Um, what is what's underlying cause of this postsympathetic syndrome? When you have an acute uh, Thrombosis, you have an obstruction of the vein, of course, with, uh, with thrombus. You treat this patient with anticoagulation, and the body itself cleaves up the thrombus. This uh, is with an inflammatory reaction, which also destroys the vein wall. You can have some destruction of the, of the, of the valves, and the thrombus is transformed into scar tissue. But in many cases, the scar tissue results in a persistent uh, obstruction, as you can see in these pictures. There's a lot of scar tissue inside the vein, which leads to obstruction. Also, in some cases, when the valves are be became incompetent, you can have some deep venous incompetence or a combination of incompetence and obstruction. This uh, post-thrombotic syndrome um, results in edema, pain, venous claudication, skin changes, and ulceration. And this is a difficult thing to treat. More and more, we like to treat this intravenously with um, catheterization, um, balloon dilatation, um, stenting. But um, these um, procedures uh, can be um, very difficult and can take a lot of time. As you can see in this case, we stented the, the cavel vein and bi uh, bilateral the iliac veins. But uh, maybe we can maybe are able to recognize these iliac veins. This results in a very high patient satisfaction rate. Then at the end, after a deep venous in, uh, in obstruction, you also have the problem of deep venous insufficiency. Also, mainly after after thrombosis, um, we can also treat as nowadays, or you can do a valvuloplasty, which means you have to you have to repair the valves. This is sometimes difficult. Another option is to create a new valve. New valve. This is the technique we nowadays are performing in our center, which has been um, invented by uh, Oscar Maletti from Modena. So we make a duplication of the vein wall, uh, and by that we um, make a new valve and um, treat the deep venous incompetence. So in conclusion, uh, chronic venous insufficiency is a very common disease. It has very high influence on patient uh, quality of life. It also results in important complications like skin changes, ulcerations, uh, bleeding, um, thrombosis, even pulmonary embolism. It's a complex disease. You also have to think, in, uh, is it superficial or deep? Uh, do we talk about incompetence or obstruction? There are many therapeutic options. You can uh, do it, start with conservative treatment, like lifestyle changes, medication, Compression, interventional techniques like surgery, individual ablation, stenting, valvular plasties, 
but unfortunately we still have these recurrences. So then you will ask me, why do we treat our patients who have such a high incidence of recurrence? First of all, after treatment, the symptomatology of, of the patient is much better. Quality of life is much better. And even if they develop recurrence, the quality of life stays better than before the treatment. You have a positive aesthetic effect, improvement of patient quality of life, and prevention of some complication like diffuse thrombosis or pulmonary embolism or development of an ulcer, bleeding, and so on. How can you prevent these occurrences? Of course, lifestyle changes um, can help, but also some regular control. After the treatment of a patient, especially when if patient with advanced disease, you have to control them after three months, six months. Look with ultrasound. If you find some recurrences, you can treat it with from sclerotherapy, and uh, so it can help them to avoid some major recurrences. So this is the end of my um, presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you uh, learned something about it. I know you in Indonesia have a fantastic, beautiful country, but also in Belgium have some nice things to see. Here's some pictures of the region where you live. I thank you for your kind attention, and I hope I can meet most of you in January in Bali for your uh, meeting there. Thank you very much. Professor Mark, for your excellent and, and comprehensive lecture. And before moving to the question and answers quest session, we, we now have the Dean representative. Dr. Dwi Ngesiningse, she is the head of specialist department at medical faculty of Diponegoro University, and she would like to give a welcome speech for you, sir. Dr. Ngesti, the time is yours. Thank you. The Honorable Prof. Dr. Mark. Good evening. The Honorable Dr. Novi Angriani, as head of committee. The Honorable of Dr. The Honorable Dr. Ilhamuddin as Head of Cardiology Department. The Honorable Dr. Pipin Ardianto as Head of Cardiology Residency Program. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. First Good morning. All, <laughs> first of all, I would like to thank each one of you for joining this guest lecture. I represent the Medicine Faculty of Universitas Diponegoro. I felt very proud to say that guest lecture like today will have a huge benefit for improving our knowledge in medical science. A very warm welcome to the renowned speaker who took this valuable time and joined us today to give his lecture, Professor Dr. Mark from Department of Vascular Surgery of St. Andrew's Hospital, Tilt, Belgium. We are so honored to have you all with us, Professor Mark. Today, we have a lecture about diagnosis and treatment of chronic venous insufficiency. Hopefully, all participants could take the advantage and understand all the materials that given. Thank you all. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Dwigen Sinengsi, for your heartwarming speech. And now we are moving to the question and answer session. There will be questions from our participants and will be answered by Professor Mark. Uh, the first question will be asked by Dr. Dini. Uh, Dr. Dini, the time is yours. You can ask Professor Mark. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Novi, for the opportunity, and good morning to Professor Mark. Thank you for your uh, interesting morning, answer. Yeah. Good morning, Professor. Uh, I have two questions for you, Professor. Mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, you already mentioned about uh, if patient have a recurrent varicose vein, doctor. Uh, if uh, our patient have recurrent varicose vein, uh, what step can we do next? And do we need to redo the intervention like surgery or EFLA, doctor? And how long is the lag from one treatment to the next? And the second question, 
uh, several studies and in uh, 2022 ESVS guideline uh, has mentioned the use of pentoxifilin for CVI uh, pharma pharmacological therapy. Uh, can pentoxifilin be used in CVI patients uh, who have ulcers, professor, and is uh, is it uh, already used in Belgium? And if it can be used, uh, how long does it last, uh, professor? That's it from me. Thank you. Two questions. I first start with the, um, the first question about recurrence. Um, what to do with recurrence? It depends. Um, what, what kind of recurrence you have. To, if you see a patient with recurrent varicose veins, you have to do again a duplex ultrasound. And then you have to look at what's going wrong. Do you have neovascularization, which is very common? Then you treat them with form sclerotherapy. Um, it can also be um, progression of the disease. For instance, you have treated the long saphenous vein, but after several years, patients now come with a short saphenous vein incompetence. Then, of course, you can treat it again with laser ablation of the frequency of, of, of the surgery or the technique you're coming with. So it depends how uh, uh, anatomically the recurrence is, um, is, is provoked. Um, also, do you have to treat all recurrences? It depends on the symptomatology of the patient, of course. Um, if they have no signs and, and no um, symptoms, then it can wait because um, Anyway, you have to, uh, to, to see that the recurrences uh, don't come too fast. Lifestyle changes is, of course, very important, especially uh, patients with obesity. They have a persistent um, venous hypertension due to the hypertension in the, in the abdomen, which um, prevents a normal um, venous, venous retour. So you can, you can do a lot of things, um, but first you have to see what's, gone, what's ongoing. First, conservative with um, lifestyle changes, stockings, and so on. Interventional, yes. Um, form therapy is a very inter interesting tool for treating patients with recurrences. Sometimes you can do a uh, re-surgery or re uh, uh, ablation, uh, depending on the anatomy of the, of the patient. Then the second question about pentoxifilin, about this um, uh, medication. Um, we don't make a lot of distinctions the, uh, the things because between the different um, flibotonics. We have um, many of them. Um, in our country, we mostly use um, Daflon, um, which is MPPF. Um, we only use this medication for um, symptomatology. So when patients complain about edema, about uh, nocturnal cramps, about the pain, we give them these flibotonics. But sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, they don't work. So um, um, they're not wonder pills. They, they have some influence on the symptomatology, but that's it. Um, so um, we mostly combi combine it with compression. And then if necessary, we switch to um, interventional techniques. Is this okay? Yes. Thank you. I think uh, you have answered very clearly. Thank you, uh, Professor Mark. And then any other questions for the other participants? Yes, uh, Professor Mark, this is Dr. Yudo. He would like to ask uh, some questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Novi. Good morning, Professor Mark. I'm Yudo from uh, Indonesia. Uh, I'd like you to ask uh, a question about uh, if we know that the patient already diagnosed with uh, chronic venous insufficiency with CEAP classification is C1 or C2, uh, and the, the patient uh, still uh, want to uh, eliminate the skin lesion in his uh, CVI, uh, what is the best approach for this patient, which is, uh, which is, it is uh, using a uh, form of sclerotherapy or maybe just uh, compression or uh, anything. Uh, what about uh, your opinion, Professor? Thank you. Do you talk about C1 or C2? C1. So teleanthesia. Um, this you can treat. Yeah. Well, there are many options to treat them. Um, you can do this with uh, liquid sclerotherapy. I shouldn't use uh, foam. Um, liquid sclerotherapy, but as I already explained, um, you risk having some pigmentation, which usually is only temporary, but for several months, 
they can have some uh, pigmentation in the place where, where you have uh, this, this sclerosis. Um, another option is to treat them with percutaneous laser. This, this is a completely different laser than we use for in the venous laser. It's a, like a yak laser you can use uh, for percutaneous treatment. Um, this treatment is a little bit painful. Um, the disadvantage is you can only treat some small segments because it's, uh, you have to um, give one shot every millimeter. So it takes a lot of time. It's a little bit painful for the patient and it's costly. But uh, using that technique can have some better aesthetic results compared to uh, sclerotherapy. Sclerotherapy, you can do a lot of telangiectasia in one session and uh, mostly uh, the result will be okay, but in some cases you will have hyperpigmentation. Unfortunately, for this telangiectasia, recurrence rate is very high, even higher than classical varicose vein. So we have some patients in our office who come yearly for a new treatment. But this is only for aesthetic reasons, of course. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Uh, is there any other questions? Uh, yes, there's one more question from the audience. Is it okay, Professor Mark? Yeah, please, of course, of course. Yes, please. This is Dr. Dina. Thank you, Dr. Nopi, and also Professor Mark. Uh, Professor Mark, you already mentioned before that uh, the therapy for superficial venous insufficiency, uh, the chosen therapy is EFLA, uh, laser ablation. But uh, still it has a uh, risk of skin damage because uh, relatively short distance from the vessel to the skin. Uh, how to prevent the risk of EFLA in superficial venous insufficiency and uh, how about microphlebotomy to the therapy of superficial venous insufficiency. Thank you, Professor. Well, um, in the visual laser ablation, that's what I'm talking about, or real frequency. Uh, when you treat veins who are very superficial, and then again, you must inject a lot of tumescence. So you have to uh, inject the, the liquid between the veins and the skin. So we can avoid any uh, risk of burning. So if you have some burning of the skin, it means that the technique is not, not well performed. You should inject a lot of liquid. That's the first thing. Another thing you can have when uh, ablating these very superficial veins is again hyperpigmentation. Um, then again, mostly it's temporary, it will disappear spontaneously, but it will take several months. You can, of course, um, make a little incision and uh, push up the, the clot. Why do we have this hyperpigmentation? Because after a treatment, an ablation of the vein, you get a, a, a thrombotic occlusion of the vein. This thrombus, of course, will dissolve after several months, but this results in um, some hyperpigmentation, some iron deposits who come in the skin. You can influence the process by making a small punch of the vein, and you push on the vein, and um, you drain some of that clot. So this, this will uh, result in less pain in the patient and also in some less hyperpigmentation. But in any case, if you have hyperpigmentation, you should wait. And in most cases, it disappears spontaneously after seven months. Okay? Yes, okay. Thank you, Professor Mark. And uh, thank you all very much for your questions. And thank you for Professor Mark for your lecture and for answering all the questions clearly. And as a token of our appreciations, uh, we have sent uh, Professor Mark uh, a caricature and two books about Indonesia as a gift. And thank we you. are looking forward to see you next year in Bali, Professor. And uh, before I close this meeting, I would like to invite again Professor Mark to give your closing remarks. Uh, Professor Mark, the time is yours. Well, um, um, thank you again for, for this meeting. And I hope you see each other in, um, in Bali because of in, in a meeting in person is, also, is always much more interesting uh, than one online. So I'd like to meet all of you in uh, the meeting in Bali, which is at the end of uh, January. Um, thank you again for the presence and for the books and the, the, the cartoon. Uh, thank you, Novi, and uh, good luck with your vein center. And we meet each other in January. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. And then last but not least, on behalf of Vascular Working Group, um, we would like to invite you for the third intervascular meeting in Nusa Dua, Bali on January 19th to 21st in, in 2023 next year. And finally, thank you, Professor Mark. Thank you, Dr. Duing Esiningsi as the representative from medical faculty of Diponegoro University and to all the participants. I am Novi Angriani signing off. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.